on three presentations covering the different fields of law um, and this gear change of looking at whether uh, fundamental rights and law has been breached in relation to the alleged surveillance activities uh, that we're looking at. Uh, first of all, international law, then the ECHR, and then EU law. Um, the first um, speaker, Professor Martin Shannon, is um, going to deal with the international law. Uh, he's over here, the international law perspective. Um, he's currently professor at the European University Institute. He was formerly the UN Special Rapporteur on the promotion and protection of human rights while countering terrorism. Professor Shannon is also leader of the so-called Survey Project, uh, financed by the seventh EU Research Framework Programme. The Survey Project deals with ethical issues, legal limitations and efficiency of surveillance. Mr. Uh, Professor Shannon uh, will cover in particular uh, the international law framework. Um, Professor Shannon, you have the floor and you're going to speak for 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Distinguished members of the European Parliament, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor to appear before this esteemed committee in this important matter of inquiry. As the chair just explained, my task is to look into the international law issue as to whether the electronic mass surveillance, mainly by the United States and the UK authorities, amounted to a breach of international law. The short answer to the question of lawfulness is that both of those countries have been involved and continue to be involved in activities that are in violation of their legally binding obligations under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights of 1966. This covenant is one of the main United Nations human rights treaties ratified by 167 countries in the world and uh, a predecessor uh, in terms of drafting to the European Convention of Human Rights, although the European Convention was finalized earlier. Neither the US nor the UK have accepted the right of individual complaint under the Covenant, which would allow the pertinent quasi-judicial body of independent experts, the United Nations Human Rights Committee, to assess whether the country violated the Covenant in respect of a specific individual. There are nevertheless two other mechanisms at the level of international law through which the same committee can address treaty compliance by these or other countries. Both the UK and the US have accepted the procedure for interstate complaints under Article 41 of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Even this procedure has not been resorted to so far. Um, the fact that two Western democracies are involved in what appears to be a massive interference with the privacy rights of EU citizens and others, coupled with the unavailability of individual redress would provide an instance where the EU countries should seriously consider triggering the interstate complaint mechanism. Independently of that option, both countries are subject to the single mandatory monitoring mechanism under the Covenant, the duty to submit periodic reports for the consideration by the Human Rights Committee, which will then, in its concluding observations, assess compliance or non-compliance. By coincidence, the United States is up for such review later this week and the United Kingdom next year. Next, I will address the question why uh, the U.S. practices of electronic mass surveillance are in breach of Article 17 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. As you can see on the slide, the central privacy provision in the ICCPR is brief, as it, for instance, lacks a fully articulated test for permiss permissible limitations. But this doesn't mean that there would not be a clear and binding legal norm capable of being applied through institutionalized practices of interpretation, such as complaint mechanisms or the reporting procedure. 
The provision prohibits unlawful interference with anyone's privacy or correspondence, and it establishes for all states parties a positive obligation to create a legal framework for the effective protection of privacy rights against interferences or attacks, irrespective of whether such interference or attacks come from the state itself, foreign states, or private actors. In 1988, Indeed, already a quarter of a century ago, the Human Rights Committee adopted a general comment number 16 on Article 17. Usually these general comments codify the committee's interpretations of a specific treaty provision based on earlier practice, including the consideration of individual complaints and state reports. By 1988, such material under Article 17, privacy, was quite limited and therefore the general comment could not possibly address all current concerns related to privacy rights. That said, as you can see from the two excerpts chosen to this slide from the general comment, nevertheless it does clearly address the question of uh, interferences requiring legal basis and the privacy rights being extended to the sphere of computers, data banks and other devices already in 1988. As United Nations Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Counterterrorism from 2005-2011, this speaker issued an one annual report uh, to the main intergovernmental human rights body of the United Nations, the Human Rights Council, which is separate from the Human Rights Committee, and that report is of direct relevance for the current inquiry. The thematic report on the right to privacy in the fight against terrorism was considered by the Human Rights Council in March 2010. The report includes a proposal that the Human Rights Committee would replace its existing general comment on Article 17 with a new one, building upon the work of the committee since 1988. In my privacy report uh, as Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Counterterrorism, I based myself on the old general comment other practice by the Human Rights Committee under Article 17, and overall work by the Human Rights Committee, including a fresh general comment on a parallel right freedom of movement, to develop uh, a rigorous test for permissible limitations in relation to privacy rights. The test includes these cumulative conditions for the determination whether an interference with privacy rights is justified or whether it amounts to a violation of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights as a matter of international law. Restrictions must be provided by the law. The essence or core of any fundamental right, including privacy, is inviolable. Restrictions must be necessary in a democratic society. If there is discretion in implementing restrictions, that discretion must not be unfettered. It is not necessary to serve a legitimate aim. The effects of the restriction must be proven to reach that legitimate aim. Restrictions must be proportionate, which means they have to be appropriate. They must mean the least intrusive uh, method, and they must provide proportionality in relation to the actual legitimate interest served. And finally, restrictions besides complying with privacy itself must not result in violations of other human rights. In the written uh, text of this statement, I am going through these elements of a cumulative permissible limitations test and concluding that the uh, overall e-surveillance architecture developed by the National uh, Security Authority of the United States did violate uh, several elements of the uh, permissible limitations test, resulting in a breach by the United States of Article 17 of the ICCPR. In other words, we are going beyond what could be justified as permissible limitations. The surveillance conducted constituted an unlawful or arbitrary interference with privacy or correspondence, uh, and this conclusion follows independently from multiple grounds. Due to time constraints, I'm only referring to some of them. Uh, the surveillance was not based on existing provisions of law as required by human rights law. It was based on vague and broad provisions of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act and the operation of a secret court 
um, resulting in secret case law, not allowing individuals to adjust their conduct to something which could be uh, foreseeable uh, in the public domain. Furthermore, um, even if reference is made to so-called metadata, the inviolability of the core of privacy is at issue because the more systematic the collection and analysis of metadata is, the more clear it is that it becomes intrusive in relation to the highly sensitive personal relations and highly sensitive categories of personal information. So metadata no longer is free game. Furthermore, the surveillance was not limited to metadata. Metadata was just a trigger that then allowed for accessing also so-called content data. I will skip the other parts of the application of the uh, test for permissible restrictions and uh, uh, simply move to addressing some work within the current surveil project mentioned by you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you have in your files uh, copies of some pages of our matrix of surveillance technologies. I see that on the screen the graphics haven't come through properly. It's a multiple uh, multi-dimension and multidisciplinary assessment of surveillance technologies where the fundamental rights scoring is basically based on two factors, the importance of a fundamental right in a given context and then the depth of intrusion which are multiplied with each other resulting in a maximum score of 16 and then subject to to two further revisions as to whether judicial authorization was given and as to the reliability of the assumptions behind the assessment. Surveil work continues to develop this semi-quantification of surveillance te technologies. Uh, we are comparing the fundamental rights intrusiveness score with a technolo te technology assessment usability score and then adding to that assessment traffic lights, red, yellow, green, related to ethical issues raised by uh, the use of surveillance technologies. Mr. Chairman, in my written statement, I referred to some other developments at the United Nations level, uh, in addition to the question of a general comment on our, under Article 17 and current compliance with Article 17 of the ICCPR, um, Germany has taken an initiative of an amending or additional protocol to the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, uh, which is an issue worth studying, but that nevertheless cannot um, make less important the need to assess under the current status of law violations of privacy rights. Um, my statement concludes with a number of recommendations starting that the Parliament should carefully study the outcome of Human Rights Committee's consideration of the U.S. periodic report later this week. Uh, the Parliament should consider the option of initiating an interstate complaint in relation to the United States for breaches of Article 17 of the ICCPR. The Parliament is recommended to consider both the question of a need for a new general comment or a protocol, amending protocol proposed by Germany. Furthermore, the Parliament is recommended to keep itself informed of domestic and European efforts to address the involvement of the United Kingdom and its GCHQ in massive intrusions into the privacy of EU citizens with a view to determining the need for its own action. Further, Parliament is recommended to pursue its own line of work in relation to the issue of intelligence oversight in Europe, both at national and EU level. And finally, uh, Parliament is recommended to support continued research, including under Horizon 2020, um, related to the right to privacy, the right to the protection of personal data, and the challenges posed by surveillance and evolving surveillance technologies. Thank you, Mr. Chen.